Bliss and Grit is an entirely listener-supported show. Supporting us is also designed to support you through keeping the episodes rolling, but also through rewards for your donation, like a getting started guide, a private forum, and downloadable meditations. To become a supporting member, you can visit patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. Hello, beautifuls. You're listening to Bliss and Grit. I'm Vanessa Scotto, and I'll be joined soon by my dear friend and co-host, Brooke Thomas. On the show, we're talking about being on the embodied spiritual path. And what does that actually mean? What is a real evolution of our lives? How do we ultimately embrace everything? All the beauty and crazy, the joys and the messes, the bliss and the grit that is a human life. Well, everyone, we are 89 episodes in and almost at our two-year Bliss and Grit anniversary. So in this week's episode, we're speaking about what it's been like for us to do Bliss and Grit over the last couple of years. From following our own mysterious divine calling, to running a business by trusting life and listening to messages, to reframing leadership to a vision of one where we heal in public. We're chatting about the inspirations we've gathered and the lessons we've learned throughout our time on the show. We couldn't have done it without you, and we're oh so grateful. Just a note, we will be taking off for the rest of the summer to refresh and recalibrate, but we'll be back in September with some next level goodness. Also, our audio quality may be a little off from usual this episode and the last one. We've had some technical difficulties that we will straighten out over the break, but we thought the episode was worth delivering anyway. If you're enjoying the show, you know we love it when people leave reviews on iTunes or our Facebook page, which is Bliss and Grit. You can also go over to blissandgrit.com to get resources, to subscribe to our weekly digest, or to become a supporting member at Patreon. One last thing, if you're new to the podcast, sometimes Brooke and I curse, so if you're in mixed non-swearing company, you may want to wear headphones. Okay, everyone, here we go. Hello, Vanessa. Hello, Brooke. So we are a couple of things, a um, little logistical piece for people listening that we're about to take a break. So for the entire month of August, we'll be off having a little integration time. Little Some of July too, I'm the thinking, right? Bit. Yeah, the very last yeah. Tuesday when we normally would publish. So we got a chunk of weeks off and... Um, while we are off at the end of August, we'll be coming up on our two-year anniversary of running Bliss and Grit. Kind of crazy, right? I know. So it's like a nice time between the anniversary and also that we're about to take a pause to, you know, reflect. On Rehash. What it's been. Rehash. Rehash. Yeah. And, you know, I before this podcast, I ran liberated body for three years. And I remember with that show, it was the same thing. Like it, it started just as kind of a seed of an idea, something I wanted to do. I had certain ideas of what it would be, what I would get from it, what listeners would get from it. And then it took me on its own ride and it became its own thing. And I would say that the bliss and grit has been, you know, very similar. It's not like you and I had any kind of hard, concrete, you know, we'll do this and then step number two looks like this. And then people will feel that, you know, it wasn't really rigid like that. But of course we had ideas of why we were doing it and what it would be for. And I would say that if I look back and God knows, I listened back to early episodes, which I won't do because it would just be probably horrifying to my sweet little egoic self, um, that it has really become its own thing. It's grown this delightful community of people all over that it's so sweet to connect with and for all of us to not feel so alone on this path for lack of better phrasing. And then also like, it's the funniest thing when you do a project like this in public, that is 
not about presenting information you've already concretized in your mind, but it's really just about you showing up, or in this case, you and I showing up and like, let's see what happens, that it really accelerates the, the personal journey, you know, one's own personal unfolding. I have, I found it on Liberated Body and I find it here too, that like, it just really is accelerant for the whole thing. And I, I mean, I look back at two years ago and I just feel like no, I've changed so much. Two years feels like such a small amount of time to say for how different I feel. Do you feel that way too? I do. And so much so that I can't, <laughs> I remember us talking about being at Crestone and first talking about doing this podcast and all of these things. But I can't even remember that conversation anymore. Two years ago feels so long ago to me. Yeah. Like I'm like, what were we saying? What was happening? Like I, it feels forever ago. That's how long ago two years feels. And it's funny because I remember we came up, I don't know when we did this, but when we came up with the blurby language for the website and for the intro, that said being on the embodied spiritual path and how do you embrace everything? I look back at it now and it's really funny because I feel like that, uh, and of course it did, but that wrote itself, but I didn't know what that meant. Like I was at the beginning of learning how to live that and learning how to live that is ongoing. So I'm not saying here I am at the, you know, <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> <across> the <laughs> spiritual finish line. Look at me. But I did. I really like reflecting back. I really didn't even know what that meant. And yet it's so close to my heart that we get to talk about this and that we get to build a bridge out of like old spiritual paradigm where there are these ways that you cut yourself off from your humanity, or there are these ideas that have gotten filtered into it and how much we keep the humanity piece in there. I think it's so interesting to look back because I'm like, I didn't know what that meant back then. And yet this project started itself with that seed and it worked on me while also making the show. It didn't have anything to do with me. It's really interesting. Yes, we sort of did, right? Because we were um, at Dharma Ocean because we were drawn to Reggie Ray's teachings and Reggie was all about being human mm -hmm. and being in the body and not, you know, falling into spiritual materialism and like transcendent states and all of these things. So it's like we had an inkling, but I suppose it's like anything else, like until you have the whole lived experience, you have no idea of like the depth and the breadth of what you were diving into. <laughs> I had no clue. And I think because I'm a body person, like that's been my work life for 20 years. And I was coming into Dharma Ocean, still running Liberated Body in my private practice, which I still run. Um, I could focus so much on the body part. Like, oh, it's so cool to sense this. And it's so cool to sense this. But I had this wall between that and my actual experience of my life. And then, of course, you know, the work does its thing and, and they start bridging each other. And it's like, oh, it's not just a cool experience I have when I meditate. It completely changes my whole life. And that's what embodiment means is not just I feel my body. I'm aware of my body. But and it that becomes a catalyst that has nothing to do with my thinking mind or to do lists or plans or goals um, that becomes something that fundamentally alchemizes my life so that this person in here feels it's in some ways very much like me. My personality feels the same, but in other ways it's inhabiting this very new way of being. It's funny. Sometimes the way I feel is like once I change I don't know how to language this, but once I change, I kind of forget who I was. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, it's not personality. Like I might crack the same jokes and I might like the same TV shows and I might like the same people. It's, it's not exactly that, but it starts to become kind of like a uh, foggy or a gossamer like to, to recall exactly what I was going through before unless I hit a bump where that gets reenacted, you know? So it's mm -hmm. like, I forgot how it felt to be like terrified and, you know, ashamed. And then you hit a bump and your nervous system goes crazy. And you're like, 
oh yeah, that's how it felt. <laughs> that sucked. <Yeah. laughs> that's that. But unless I do that, I, so what's funny is I'm trying to think back as you're talking to like, well, who was I two years ago? What was I going through? What was I thinking? And I'm like, I don't even know. I can't even differentiate. It just feels almost like another person, which is funny. Mm -hmm. And not so much that I'm not embarrassed by the idea of going back and listening to us two years ago. <laughs> There's still something in there. <laughs> still enough mm -hmm. association with that was me. Actually, one of my friends the other day who listens to the podcast it's like a couple of weeks back. And I was talking about that. I was talking about how interesting it is to kind of heal in public and to be someone in this field who's actually sharing at such a high personal level with such a high degree of vulnerability. And, and how I bet if I went back two years ago and I listened to some of the things I say, because I'm always just talking about my experience and my experience has changed and shifted so much that I would be like, I don't even agree with that anymore. Oh yeah. And then he started laughing and he's like, actually, that's super tempting to go back and listen through. And I'm like, Hey, don't go back <laughs> and listen through with like wanting to comb to hear how <laughs> whack I was. Your bad ideas. <laughs> it, it started making me think like, I wonder if we went through again and we took all the categories that we spoke about, you know, like fear and we spoke about self-love and we spoke about intimacy, I wondered if we went back through and spoke about all those categories, how similar what we would say now would be to what we said then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I almost don't with like this little, um, self-aware part of me was just like, don't say, because then people listen to it. But I think back, I think like our third episode, which was our first official episode after the in Meet Vanessa, Meet Brooke episodes was Why the Body? Because we're going to talk about the body and I was on Libra. I really get it. And I remember being, first of all, nervous as hell and awkward. And then also like, okay, so cognitive, basically, right? Like I'm going to pull these ideas from embryology and these interviews. And I'm going to like hand over on a platter these cognitive ideas about how important the body is to our, our personal growth and our personal unfolding. I mean, I have so many times wanted to re-record an episode. No, really. Why the body? <laughs> <laughs> now that like I've lived it much more deeply, and, you know, much now more that intimately. I actually exist in my right, body in a conscious way, the, the thing that is aware of my life and that I pay attention to more instead of these like cognitive ideas. And of course, like, that episode, there would be wanting to seem like I know what I'm talking about, wanting to seem like somebody who has important information to hand over, somebody who has their shit together, um, has important things to talk about for people to listen to. And at some point, you know, I think this was always our intent because we've always had this connection as friends where when we hang out, these are the conversations we're having socially, always for 15 years or however long. And we knew that we wanted to do that in public. So it's not like shocker. Then we started yeah. doing that on the show. But I didn't really realize um, how vulnerable that would be. And also just that you and I started this show because it was born at Dharma Ocean at the Meditating with the Body program. We started it when we didn't realize yet, but that we had just gone down a slip and slide of personal growth. You know, that, that there was this rapid accelerant working on each of us individually and then we're coming together to talk about it in public. And it's like, I don't know, I don't even remember where we were at at what point, but you and I both one week, while not talking to one another in our lives, which happen in different cities for those listening, that we both got this like download, for lack of a better phrase, we were like, oh my God, that's the point is that we're living this in public. But there's like a record oh. <laughs> of two people just doing just two regular people doing this in public and being really open about their healing process as opposed to, you know, healing in public as opposed to, um, I'm healed. Let me tell the story who, who've got it figured out. And yeah, it was, I mean, it's kind of silly to realize because it's always these deeper and deeper layers, like that it took us, I don't know, a while, many episodes in before we were like, Oh, that's what we're doing. 
I think that might have even been like a year in. <laughs> yeah, at least a year in. It totally was. It felt like it was definitely beyond the halfway point. It was like, oh, it's, it's weird. just a record of two regular people talking about their healing paths. And then other people get to hear it and go, you know, me too. Or, you know, have their own inquiries based on our own. And it's just a I different know. way in. It's, it's always this way, right? Because it's not, as you said, it's not that that wasn't sort of known to us, but then like an epiphany has such a different quality, like when it really clicks into place and you're like, oh, that's what's up. It was probably after like the third time we had a deep vulnerability hangover after an episode, which luckily I think we've only had like three or four where we were like, Oh God, that <laughs> was, Oh, should I have said so much? Are we going to really publish it? Yeah. <laughs> but it was probably after our like fourth vulnerability hangover where we were like, Oh, this is what's up. This is just what we do here. <laughs> it's like, if you wanted to have years worth of recordings of what it's like for people on awakening paths, like meeting all of their internal conditioning. Here it is. Right. And they will look back and go, Oh, I really had not felt into that. Or I was really unaware of that. Or wow, I didn't see that blind spot. Because that's the point (laughs) is that it's an ongoing lived process, but in public. Well, this same friend that had said, Oh, I'm going to go back and listen. He was kidding. I think. I'm sure. But he, um, he was also asking me, well, given that, you know, given that you suspect, I don't really know. I mean, we still have new listeners starting from the beginning who are in great communication with us seem to think it's all wonderful, but given that you suspect you might say things differently, you know, if you were to go back and do it over again, I don't know how I phrased it, but kind of like, how do you deal with that with like teaching in public? when you're always changing and you may say something at one point that you don't believe anymore at another point. And I'm like, well, I mean, if we weren't willing to risk that, I don't just mean you and I, I mean, all leaders, all teachers, all practitioners, if we weren't willing to risk saying something that we later may evolve past, well, then when would we ever speak? You know, like at what point is it final enough or clear enough? I mean, some of the teachers we've interviewed, like Karen Trace has probably given teachings early on. She, you know, shifted or clarified. We know Matt Kahn has, he's basically told it in, Mm -hmm. on his retreats, like, Hey, I've updated this or, Hey, I've learned this. So I'm like, it's just, it's an interesting thing being in the role of facilitator, teacher, leader, where part of the vulnerability is, you know, we're always only working with the portion of the elephant that Mm -hmm. we can feel at any given time. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's part of what makes it more comfortable that we do the best we can to speak from our experience instead of expertise, because I know how much, um, we know and don't know, like, I know there's so much we yet don't understand But that's the same thing that also makes it ooey gooey and super vulnerable and kind of unformed. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting exploring all of that. Well, it's a container that brings forth, I think, a lot of genuineness. And I say that because I see this happening with other leaders, too. And some of the people listening are either practitioners of some kind or they do public facing projects like this or they're writers or whatever. And I think that so many of us have grown kind of allergic to the person who crossed the finish line and, you know, of the whatever personal growth marathon, self-fulfillment marathon, spiritual path, marathon, whichever marathon you want to pick, they crossed the finish line, healthy eating marathon, and they're going to go back and like be your coach, right? Yeah. Your guru really in yeah, a way. Your guru. And, and I think that one of the things that we're saying is that we don't believe in a finish line. You know, that we just reject that idea completely. I mean, you and I have both been in in different ways and in our own ways, but we've been on this path of self-exploration and unfolding for decades, decades. And both of us, starting from very young, early childhood, these were our questions. And this was our interest in being human beings. 
So it's not like we, you know, just jumped on some brand new thing and then started talking about it. Like these are well-formed things over our lifetime. And yet we understand that there, even if let's say 20 years from now, 30 years from now, I think we'll still feel like, well, there's just plenty more to evolve into. So this is just a record of a human being going on an evolving process. And I think it really serves for not just for us to do that, but for anyone to do that, because it's so helpful. It's one of the reasons why memoirs are so compelling. It's like, here's a human being who lived this. And look what happened in the story of the development of their life. And we get something from that. We really get our own insights and our own growth just from following along with their growth. So I just think it's an interesting model. I think it's a a developing one of learning in public or healing in public, as opposed to I cross the finish line here. Here's the cheat sheet. (laughs) I mean, it's definitely an interesting one. I can't say I don't sometimes wonder if we pretended we were more expert about everything, if we wouldn't have an even bigger audience, but I love the audience that we have. (laughs) Some people are allergic to, the finish line mentality, but I think there's still a decent chunk of our population that craves, you know, answers like, please just break it down into the top five ways to reach this destination. But I feel like, do you ever think about this? I don't know if I kind of came up with this or if I heard it from a teacher somewhere, you know, at a certain point you just start to integrate knowledge as yours, but do you ever think about how like the collective consciousness is evolving together Mm -hmm. and that, you know, the collective kind of will have its developmental phases too. So sometimes I think about, let's say, you know, the sixties and seventies and, you know, teachers like Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche who are coming in and all of these Indian gurus and Tibetan gurus. And I think, you know, they were like, in some ways, at least Chogyam Trungpa and some of those teachers were the first level of rebellion where it was like, you don't have to live in a monastery or in one of these ancient cultures in order to be exposed to these spiritual paths. You also don't have to go all the way over to India. And so I feel like they were first just trying to break people out of spiritual materialism, you know, um, open their minds a little bit, give them a taste of the transcendence. And I don't mean on purpose. It's just like collectively. And then you keep looking and you're like, then there was like the guru time where everybody looked up to the guru and they use the guru as an example of who they want to embody. And then they try to cultivate those qualities. And then in this phase, it seems like this being human thing, the embodiment thing, the integration thing. Like if you listen to teachers who are talking about things like non-duality or awakening, Buddhism, all of these like larger spiritual philosophies I mean, it's like the eight day and age of like, oh no, you can have a human life and be spiritual because they're not separate. And I think it's just cool when you watch how the evolution of consciousness is. It's like, that's what's up right now. And who knows what'll be up soon. It's fascinating. I mean, when you think back, it's like the introduction of the idea, you are not your thoughts, which for each of us as individuals is also groundbreaking, earth shattering, like the moment where you have some actual lived experience of, oh my God, I'm not those thoughts. And you get a little separation, like that's a big deal. It's a big moment. Um, and for a long time, the spiritual path was like, I mean, I mean, I don't want to reduce it all that. It was many, many, many things, but there were ways that it could get boiled down to just like, you are not your thoughts. And then, you know, people could hold on to that kind of thing. So it's, it is, it's really cool to see this embodiment conversation coming through. And we have... It- just a little plug sand conference that we're going to be at this October Talking about the body, <laughs> but it's interesting because it's a conference on it's a non-dual conference. And the whole theme this year is being human. Like yeah, how, how is a human life and a spiritual life, not only not in conflict, but the exact same thing. Well, here's another thing about collective energy. So, so if y'all are listening, if you have ever thought when listening to an episode oh my God, they're talking right to me, <laughs> right? You know how often you hear that you hear from people? constantly, which is like, so sweet. Oh my God, I think you're speaking right to me. Like where, you know, they're like tracking in alignment with us in their growth journey. And <laughs> this is just like my own internal experience of this. I'm not saying this is the way, but I'm like, I think we are speaking right to you. I think that's actually what's happening. I think 
somehow, some way, this is what happens with collectives. It's like, like, just like you and I can track sometimes like our journeys and we're like, Oh, I'm going through this. I'm going through a tour of the nervous system, I'm going through this. And we're like, Oh, or, you know, if you all, y'all don't know this, but when Brooke and I want to come up with the topic for the week, I mean, it's the most insanely unorganized process <laughs> in the world of podcasting. We mm-hmm. like, maybe we'll text. Usually we just jump on we're like, I was kind of thinking about this and I was kind of thinking about that. We're like, Oh, you know what? They kind of have this in common. Let's just talk about that. And, and we go right. So just the same way as like you and I track each other, Brooke, and there's some unfolding kind of parallels, let's say, or explorations. I'm thinking, yeah, I think the thousands of people who listen to us, like we're going on the journey together. Mm -hmm. Like it's all co-arising. Like we don't know why we're thinking of what we're thinking of it for a week. It seems like it's personal sometimes because some things going on in our lives, but even that who's to say that it's not part of just some, you know, sacred rhythm where we've all committed to just evolving in the human lineage together. It's really that- cool to see the unity consciousness thing actually like tangible evidence of it because we have Yeah, like this- do you think that too? Does oh, that make totally sense for do. you? I totally do. And it's kind of like if you go see a, a really mature teacher who holds a satsang. And so there's one person who asks the teacher a question and the teacher answers that person's question. But if you're really open, you can see how the the per- question and the answer serve everyone there. Not just in a like, oh, it's good information to know how to heal a broken heart because that woman asked about it and maybe in a couple years I'll deal with that or whatever. Not like collecting toolkit stuff, but like it speaks directly to you right in that moment. Even if you thought the conversation had nothing to do with you, someone stands up and, and the question is around, I lost my job and I feel whatever. But the way that it gets answered or the, the angle that it comes to about self-worth or safety in the world or whatever. You're like, Oh my God, that serves just perfectly. And I really think that that's what is so gorgeous about spiritual communities is that unity consciousness, you get to see evidence of it. And when we get all these great messages from people, emails or on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, that are like, how are you guys get out of my head? (laughs) How How are you tracking everything I'm going through? Every episode is like exactly on track with what is happening for me. And I think it's just because, you know, and in some ways it's so great, right? That we just let the mystery be the mystery. We just hop on Skype or text each other. And it's like, this is what's coming up for me right this moment. It's like, oh, that's related to this other thing that's coming up for me. And we just go. It's it's a little bit not to make it like woo-woo or sound super important, but it's it's like channeling because literally everything's like channeling, right? Because we're just doing our things and life's just moving through us, right? But you get this evidence for it that's so sweet. Well, right now I'm reading this book called The Surrender Experiment Me too, by Michael Singer. It. Oh, you yeah, started it. Yeah. Isn't it so interesting? Okay, for all you listening, we're doing a book club on it. We're doing um, you know, a virtual version on Patreon and I'm doing one in Austin and one in LA because that's where I'm going to be spending time. So, but anyway, so I I started it, right? So I'm reading it. I'm almost, I don't know, at least halfway through. And uh and the whole premise This is the guy who wrote the book, The Untethered Soul, for those of you who may know that book. The whole premise is starting around, I don't know, when he's 18, 19, he starts to realize that that there's something to the divine universal flow where he should trust his life more than his own thought process or even personal preferences. So he decides he should kind of just surrender to the flow of life and see where life takes him. You know, it's kind of like just our trust your life, which is one of the main principles we started this podcast based on, right? So as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking about our experiment, which is really what we did. I mean, his is cool because it's like 40 years in the making. So you have like this huge span of time where you see how this played out for him. Also, he became like a billionaire and <laughs> like had a retreat like pretty center. Interesting. And, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. We're not sharing a story at that level of intrigue and drama quite yet. But nevertheless, it's sort of funny. Like not only 
are we vulnerably exposing every single human challenge we have in the most intimate and like clarified way over and over again? But there's this other level of vulnerability of not knowing exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it and exactly where it's leading, you know, Mm -hmm. like in business, (laughs) usually people start like, so, okay. So Brooke and I started, Brooke had this very lovely and popular podcast, the liberated body. Many of you had listened to it, but some of you may be just learning about it. Okay. So she'd kind of done the free podcast thing, put a lot of gorgeous time and effort into it. And we're like, you know, this is how we start. We're like, we probably shouldn't recreate the just work really hard for free model. We should probably have something, you know, like some way that will make income off it or whatever. So Brooke and I sat down and we strategized and we came up with like retreats that will run and (laughs) courses we'll give. And then like, I don't know how long it took for us to just like let that go completely out the window. I don't know, like a month. Yeah, it was pretty quick. (laughs) But you know, basically what actually happened in reality was we were like, following our delicious. Yes. Like, we'll we love this. We don't want to stop. So we'll just do it and we'll see where life is taking us and we'll keep responding to where life is taking us. And so it's interesting. Cause like, I don't know, what is it like once every two or three months where we're like, okay, one of us is like, <laughs> what are we doing here? What should we be doing? Should I be marketing? Should I be, what should I be doing? And then we're like, eh, we, we know just we see want to get on the call every week and that that's like totally delightful, serves us, seems to serve the community of people who find us it's like great. But you know, if we want to like trace the life does it for us movement a little bit, one of the things when we were trying to come up with like, okay, do we do a retreat? If we do a retreat, what are we? Are we presenting ourselves as spiritual teachers? Cause I don't really want to do that. Okay. Are we presenting it as just come hang out for a weekend? It's like, well, I don't really want to like build a business around like, let's all be besties. It sounds fun. And like for a while we were like, sure, we just hang out just community is super important. It's something that's really important to us. And people could meet not just us, but like this whole community of people. So for a while we were like, that's cool. That's cool. And then we started talking with more teachers and we thought, oh, it would be so nice if we could put together something like where we host a teacher who we really admire. And so we're hosting someone like John Prendergast or Locke Kelly or whoever. But then it got all complicated, right? Because it's now not only two schedules, but three schedules and travel. And does anyone make any money off of that? Like, because it's a lot of work to be away from family and your other paying jobs and life. So we were like, well, it would be great if we could be with teachers and in a community of people who are on the spiritual path. And we're not having to present ourselves as spiritual teachers. And we were like, but I don't know. And then Jeannie Zandy, God bless her, writes to us and she's like, are you guys going to Sand? You should host a panel <laughs> about, I don't know. I'd be on it. Said. I'd be on it about like yin and awakening and the feminine and whatever. And we're like, oh my God, that'd be so fun. So we would be doing exactly what we do. We're moderating, we're holding space, we're hosting a panel in a place that's already gathering a bunch of people in this on this path. And it's all these teachers gathered. It's still not going to pay us any money. We'll crack that code eventually. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Y'all realize we have full-time jobs outside of this, right? In case you didn't realize it, you're a listener. (laughs) But um, it was like, oh, that's all the things that we wanted, minus the pay, in one place. And it just, it really just genuinely arrived on a silver platter, courtesy of Jeannie. Oh, God. Well, I mean, rewinding before that, we're always like we didn't know what exactly was the point of us doing this other than for our delight and for our passion. And we wanted to really, it was just like, I don't know. I want to. And so we practice trust and living in the unknown. So we started it. Right. And then we're like, well, I'm pretty sure I'd love to have more conversations with teachers, you know, about this path. And so, you know, Brooke and I were both mentoring with Kieran Trace at the time, you know, maybe about a year or so ago when we had our first teacher conversation and we're like, Kieran, do you want to be on the show? She's like, yeah, sure. So we're like, okay, easy peasy. Let's have Kieran on. So we do that. And then we're like, all right, but I don't know how we'll get other teachers on, but that was super fun. Hope that happens again someday. We'll see. So we're on Facebook and we, I posted a quote of Jeannie Zandies and one of our lovely listeners, you know who you are. I don't know if I should name you, but 
tags Jeannie's Andy and was like, oh, Jeannie, like I love Bliss and Grit. Or it was like something just simple like that. And you go, Jeannie, I'd love to have you on the show. And Jeannie was like, sure. Yeah, it was so like a like, week later. Look, <laughs> you're like, look at that. Person mm-hmm. number two, right? And then you just happened to meet John Prendergast on retreat. That's right. And then we just happened to write to John Lockley. He said, yeah, right. And we told this story, I think at some point recently, but next thing you know, all of these things are kind of unfolding. So (laughs) it's a very funny way to run an enterprise, which make no mistake. I mean, we would love this to be an enterprise. So it's, we treat it that way, even though, um, on some levels, it's really just our passion project. But it's a funny way to run it, right? Where you're like, I'm not sure. I don't know where it's leading, but I'm going to trust what keeps unfolding. Like the most recent genie inviting us and us then getting accepted onto the SAM panel and already having a lineup of teachers who'd say yes, because we met them all and had them on our show. And And Dorothy knew the founders of SAND and she wrote to them and really said, please accept their application and Dorothy was going to be, I mean, just all these things that were like gift, 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 gift. I know. So it would be fun to see where it actually keeps moving towards, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, for, for all of you listening, it's like literally just as much a mystery to us as it might be to all of you. And, and I guess that's the interesting part of life, right? Like to actually, when you talked earlier, Brooke, about when you spoke God, hearing my own grammar when I hear these things back, it's like I'm (laughs) such, I was a bad student on grammar. Anyway, we spoke about it earlier. Um, I distracted myself with my personal criticism. (laughs) Oh, I know when that happens. Well, I had the Debbie Downer sound. Oh, about how you didn't even know what it was like to be on a human path, right? And an embodied spiritual path. You don't even know what it means. Well, it's like trusting your life. What we spoke about on a conceptual level yeah. in practice to realize like, I'm not doing this, the sort of typical American way, you know, typical American way you set goals, you have business strategies, you break them down, you have a plan, you execute, you sell yourself, you know, you're working towards clear objectives. You're watching markers of growth. Like this is a typical American execution of any kind of goal. And, you know, with all the, like, you have to work hard. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it doesn't feel alive. It's the decision you made in the meeting last week, you know? Yeah. And it's like, just to be in this area, we can afford it because we do pay our bills. Like we have everything taken care of. There's actually not a high risk, but for us just to be playing with, what happens if we um, don't let our grabby hands get involved <laughs> and we just stay aware and attuned to the actual unfolding process of what's rising up right under our feet and what life's inviting us towards? Yeah. It's really interesting. And we also don't let our victim martyr get involved, which is like, well, I just do it for free forever, I guess. Or, you know, it's just how we go, you know, we don't, we don't know what it'll be or how long we'll want it to run or how it's designed to serve. And it certainly, I don't have any attachment to like, it needs to be giant, but I also don't have an attachment to it needs to be tiny or it needs to not be a part of, you know, how we make a living or, so it's just kind of cool because it's just wide open. And like you said, I mean, fortunately we have private practices that just allow us a lot more leeway. So the, the grabby hands, the desperation vibe, and like fear and stuff can't really get its grubby little paws all over the project. And it can just be a living experiment of actually trusting your life. Actually. And what's weird is this is so meaningful for me. It's, it's hard to describe because of course my private practice work is so meaningful, you know, sitting with people and being able to support them in their lives. But something about this show Mm -hmm is so significant. Like when we get letters or notes or reviews or just looking at our Patreon page and like chatting with people there, like I find it so utterly meaningful. So it's like, well, as long as it's meaningful, this is what's up. Yeah. I mean, and I have literally no idea how long that will last for, for us, like forever, 
for right. a month? Like what? I'm like, what's going to happen? I know. It's re- cliffhanger. <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> it's so interesting. It's so fun to be exploring with something like that. Just letting it be. And also, you know, cause we were talking about the way that it's meaningful as a project. I just delight. I'm always thrilled to get on Skype and have whatever conversation we have. I'm thrilled about hearing from people and hearing that it's meaningful on their journeys and that there's this community of people who feel not so alone being the somatic senses on an embodied spiritual yeah, path. Yeah, which know, is huge. That's so significant to me. It's such a big deal to, you know, it's such a big heart goal, you know, or heart desire for both of us to provide that kind of visible presence and support for you are not alone. And this is a real thing. And you're really going through this. Um, and I mentioned this at the beginning of our talk. It's really true. It's been such an accelerant for me too. not in the sense of it's like my therapy. I wouldn't say that because there's a certain idea of what therapy is in my mind anyway, but things change much more quickly, right? Because I have to articulate what my genuine lived experience is in public and with you. And you have a great deal of, you know, expertise and and intelligence. And then we can just kind of go on this journey. Like I'm thinking even about the the last episode that we recorded they went off on some bizarre tangent about superstition. I cannot even remember what I said, but I remember regretting it at the end of the episode that it was just a, you know, tangent. And one of the things I was kind of saying was, oh, about allowing the feeling and not covering up, right? Like putting on a new Halloween costume, new mask. And you were talking about like, well, sometimes, you know, there are ways to feel into behavioral changes that don't involve shame or blame. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that landed for me in that moment, in that call, because I just... I'm so opposed to putting on the Halloween costume and I'm so much more prone to lay around in my own despair. (laughs) (laughs) Just make it all cozy in there. My naked despair. (laughs) That's just what's up for the rest of my life. And And, you know, ever since we had that talk a few days ago, I've been waking up in the morning and saying, I'm going to look for the good. Um, because actually right after we recorded the talk, I went to a barbecue with friends And I watched myself just be Debbie Downer. You know, like someone would say something about the move and I'd be like, oh, my poor, tired, old body. Why does your body feel old? It just is. It's just, I'm just, I can't physically do it. I'm exaggerating. I'm not this much of a bummer at parties. We had a lovely time. There were some more. fun, everybody. I just want to also. There was a water slide. It was awesome. But I could just see so much more. And before, I mean, I was doing the exact same thing. I just didn't have awareness. So I went home and I'm like, this is hilarious. I just recorded a conversation with Vanessa about the power of words. And the words we use about ourselves and how we present them to other people keep recreating. I am that person. Oh, it's stressful. I'm old and tired. I have to do it all by myself. And then I go enact it, right? (laughs) Right. So I was like, all right. Behavioral experiment doesn't involve shame or blame, doesn't involve a Halloween costume. I'm going to go on an energetic scavenger hunt, which is something I've been talking to my clients about too, because it's been so fun for me. I'm going to look for the good. I'm not going to ignore the bad. And at the exact same time, I'm going to look for the good. I tell you, it has been like somebody just like hit this reset button on my nervous system. And it's like, I mean, I just have so much more access to delight. I don't describe myself in such Debbie Downer terms. I'm not Debbie Downer about other people's whatever. Not like I'm slamming other people down, but I can, I can indulge in Debbie Downer about the world, right? Not like, well, don't try doing that. It'll never work out. But I can be more like, yes, the world is, we are a disgusting species, you know, I'm doing way less of that. And yet my heart's wide open for any friend that happens to be in that place. It's fascinating. You know, so that's something that wouldn't have occurred without us having these live conversations. And I, I believe that that's also serving for the people listening. I know because they're telling us. So how fun, like who knows what little nuggets will get sprinkled around that actually resonate for people and come alive. But it's just a lot of different ways of exploring our lives differently. Yeah, that's funny, actually, because... I've been thinking about that talk 
too. And like, what is that fine balance when, for example, I had to leave Austin because my, I had a little bit of a relapse because of that elevated levels of mold there. I think, I think that's what it is. Who knows exactly. But regardless, so I'm like, that's interesting. So when people ask you how you feel, what is it I want to say here? And, you know, I'm like exploring Mm -hmm. and I'm exploring how when my nervous system really is hijacked, it's hard to think about or talk about anything but those negative things. So that's interesting. So then how do you give it fuel? Maybe by going on a scavenger hunt. Yes. So it is, it's, it's evocative for us. It's, Mm -hmm. It's almost too, you know, when, when people go to counseling or therapy or anything like that, even if they went to um, Feldenkrais or Rolfing or anything in those categories, what happens is you engage your awareness muscle more. It's like you have to track yourself more because you know you're going to go in and you're going to speak to this person. So maybe some of it's rational, maybe all of it is mystical. And really, just once you step through the threshold, you know, your awareness keeps turning. Who can say? But there's certainly an awareness process. So just by us having conversations every week, I mean, we're tracking our experiences because we're thinking what we talk about, (laughs) you know, in part. And then like the teachers that we've had on, like Amoda Ma, I had no idea who she was. I had never come across Amoda's work before she reached out to us because... Yeah, that was a wild one too. She's Yeah, I don't even know if you guys know this. We might have just said this. I know we were talking about this serendipitous flow at some point, but you know, crazy story. She was like Googling and found the bliss and grit website. And she says specifically, I have no idea how, but she read it, liked it and just wrote to us. I was like, can I be on it? And we're like, send us a book. We'll see. Read her book. We're like, Oh hell yeah, let's do it. So like, Having those teachers on and reading their books, like yeah, everyone's, so many people write us like, how do you guys have so much time for retreats and like reading and listening to podcasts? And we're like, I don't know. It's I our life know. calling. I don't know. I, I don't know. know how I do it. I'm not sure. But because we get exposed to them, I can say, I think I have accelerated at a really rapid pace in terms of access to clarity and access to seeing things and thinking about things and experiencing things because look at who we're speaking to and look at whose presence we're in. Yeah. We're really fortunate that way because just being in their presence, having a chance to talk with them is so good. And yeah, if there's ever the, how can they manage to do it? Like we genuinely have no idea. Neither one of us is sitting on a trust fund. We both are self-employed. If we don't work, we don't earn. I'm raising a kid on my own. And yet, you know, so instead of like shooting ourselves, I should be able to make it happen too, or I should be at more retreats. I don't know. I don't know why this is such a devotion for us and that opportunities for it to happen keep going. But uh, that's what's up. So yeah, that's what's up. And that's what was up before we started. Mm -hmm. Or I would say, well, maybe it's just a part of like having a podcast that incentivizes you like it might incentivize me to track myself a little better over the week to see if there's any interesting gem I could like mine for a conversation. But I'm pretty sure I was already or I know I was I was already listening to podcasts every morning when I exercised and then reading books and like, so I guess it's just part of our calling. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of the mystery that is this, this podcast and this conversation. And, you know, we're just recapping today. We'll see if this is interesting for all of you guys to listen to, but from our perspective, as we reflect back, it's just kind of crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy that when we spoke about our suicidal thoughts and, and your attempt when we, a few episodes ago, I didn't even have a vulnerability hangover after that. I have a little bit of a one. <laughs> I haven't talked about that in public ever. I mean, I, I but mean, I didn't keep me up at night. It was just like, yeah, like that's what we do. I talked about it a little bit in the past, but that was a pretty explicit description. And I'm like, all right, this is what we do. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I guess I've come to trust that like, listen, for all you tune in, the fact is sometimes we, hang up after a conversation and either Brooke or I are like, Oh my God, (laughs) why did I say that? Or, Oh my God, I was trailing off. Where did I go? Or, 
you know, whatever. We, we have all sorts of things that can pop up around that. But after having done it for two years and having all of you, like I fucking love this audience. I love when people write us on social media and like gauge with us. I love the way they share. I love when we get letters. Like I think the coolest people are engaging with us. And so I just keep trusting. I know what we're doing is not perfect. I know I could be more top notch. I don't have to use the word like so much. Or <laughs> sure. I certainly do that about myself. Um, um, maybe um. I don't have to always get completely <laughs> paralyzed every time a teacher comes on and go into some nervous <laughs> rant. <laughs> and then I felt this and then I felt that. And I guess I don't have a question, but, so. but you get it. <laughs> do you get it? So maybe that's all the case. And you know, obviously I do have to do it or I'd be doing something different. But the point is I trust something good's happening because of the people who are here with us. Right. So I trust, okay, it's not not perfection, but it's sacred and it's beautiful and it's connection and it's birthing something. I couldn't even predict how good this was going to feel. I couldn't even predict quite how meaningful it would be and how, you know, despite the fact like, you know, behind the scenes when you have a podcast, like you know, we are paying for things and we have a sound editor and we have to like do editing work and gathering work. And, you know, there's like a social media, like ugh, snooze. Sometimes who wants to tune into social media? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I actually kind of like it cause I think it's fun to engage, Which, but like God not every know. day I like it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like all of those things that go into it. And the thing is that this podcast and this audience are and time with you, Brooke is like, so rich, so meaningful. I I don't even second guess it. I don't even think twice Mm. for all of the other elements that are involved that don't just involve a wonderful hour of you and I chatting. Amen to all of that. And I think how fun to like do this little recap and digest a little bit, everything that's been going on the last couple of years, not everything, but just to touch point back. And, um, as we head into some integration time off and hopefully everyone listening will also feel like that's what serves, you know, a little time to do whatever you want to do and integrate everything that's been going on. Yeah. Sometimes it's really good to integrate without wondering if you'll talk about it. You know, like there's a certain level where we're talking a lot right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and sometimes it's good like not to touch it we did I remember talking about an episode I can't remember what it was but we're like stop touching the wound stop <laughs> picking at it you know no. like sometimes it's good just to breathe without such a high level of reflection so mm. I am looking forward to a little break from that level yeah and um and to see what we come back with yeah I, I mean like something I don't know what I'm hoping for born. it just feels like there's something that's not cognitively of us that wants to come forward and honestly we might come back it might sound exactly the same but there might just be something internally that feels more in alignment I don't know but there's something about the pause that, like something it, it, we're definitely turning a page I have no idea what yeah the I'll, page. I'll put out like maybe more teachers. I think I'd like, I'd like to continue that. So yeah. I'll put out that little bit Me into too. the universe. And if any of you know, Arya Shanti, Vanessa would very much like to speak with him on Bliss and Grit. Amen. So Brooke as well. Mm-hmm. Universal. What, what? Just in case. <laughs> and lastly, I'm just so grateful to all of you. Really, truly, you listening lets us be us. You writing lets us know we're not falling into the void, that what we do matters. Um, and that's a very special thing. I couldn't say it better myself. I'm really grateful. I'm looking forward to coming back on the other side and seeing what happens next. Happy two year anniversary. Yay, two years. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. The show notes, including all the resources we mentioned, live at blissandgrit.com. If you go to the website, you can scroll down and you'll see each episode separate post. We put the resources right there. Our member platform is at patreon.com backslash bliss and grit. You can head over there and donate to help us keep the show going and also get rewards for your support. 
If you've wanted to engage with these topics with us in a deeper way, it's a great place to go for a more immersive experience. We also love seeing you all on Instagram and Facebook, so come on over and chat with us. We're so grateful for the reviews you've written, for the membership support so many of you had provided. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, and for all the notes that you send. Remember, we'll be on break until September, so we'll see you then.